Okay, there are some special cases for boundary work. Now, what I want you to do is add in some equations at the back of the chapter, because your author does not have all of the boundary work equations that are convenient. He has more than he had in the, well, maybe he does. Yeah, he may have all of them. I don't know. I think you still have to add a couple of our number out. Chapter 4? Chapter 4. Yeah, I'm on page uh, 195 to find the uh, summaries, summary equation. All right, so you understand that since boundary work is the area under a curve, if we don't know the shape of that curve, we can't figure out the boundary work. But if we do know the shape of the curve, if we do know how pressure depends on volume, then that defines this line and would allow us to calculate the area of that curve. Now it turns out that there are some gases that behave, or some processes, some systems, where the gas behaves polytropically. That doesn't have anything to do with ideal gas. All it means is that the gas obeys this relationship. It's pressure times its volume to some power n is equal to constant. That's all polytropic means. Nothing more, nothing less. It just happens to be that the gas is doing that. Okay? What's the rate okay. N is an exponent that is a constant yet to be determined. Okay. So it's C. Right. If I told you a gas was behaving polytropically calculate boundary work, your correct answers are what is N and what's C. Now I can give them to you in sneaky ways, but you have to figure them out to use them. Okay? Use what I'm about to show okay. Now if it's a polytropic process, then it's obeying this equation, and like I said, we know the shape of this curve. Because if PV to the N is a constant, then rearranging the equation, the pressure depends on volume by this equation. It's the constant times the volume to the negative N power. So you can plug in for the pressure in this equation, where boundary work is the integral of P to V, where you plug in CV to the negative N for pressure, and then this integration can actually be performed because you guys might remember in calculus that you learned at one point how to integrate x to the n dx, right? Just x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Well, this is the exact same form. C is just a constant, so it comes out. Right? We're told C is a constant, so it's out of here. Negative n, well, that's just a, a weird exponent, right? n could be positive or negative for this. The only thing that, that n could not be in that equation was what? Negative 1. Because if it's negative 1, then you've got the integral of 1 over x dx, which is a little bit special. It's a natural log of x. Okay? Anyway, we'll come to that in just a moment. Let's not worry about that for the time being. Basically, all we have to do is add 1 to the exponent and divide by the exponent plus 1. So there we go. That's done. If we were to uh, distribute the constant, then here it is. It's distributed. Make the denominator look a little more normal by rearranging, just one minus n. And then realizing that the laws of exponent, if you have in the exponent two numbers that are added together, then you can represent that by multiplying the variable to the power of each of the, the two that were added together. In other words, instead of writing v2 to the negative n plus 1, we're going to write v2 to the negative n multiplied by v2 to the power of 1. Normally, we don't, we don't write that power of 1. So anyway, we've broken it up, and now we realize, well, wait a second, CV to the negative n is just P. So CV2 to the negative n is just P2, and CV1 to the CV1 to the negative n is just P1. We can make that substitution and come up with a, an equation for boundary work in the case where we have a polytropic gas, or polytropic behavior of some system, system that has a gas in it. It doesn't have to be a real gas or an ideal gas. It doesn't matter. It just The gas just has to be... Uh, in obedience to this law. So there's the equation, and your author has it for you uh, as equation three. A polytropic process, boundary work can be calculated this way as long as n is not equal to one. Because think about it. If n is equal to one, then one minus one is zero, and boundary work blows up. It doesn't make any sense. You're dividing by zero, which is not the right answer. It doesn't mean you get an infinite amount of work out of something. Okay? It just means you made a math error. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? That would be nice. Yeah, we wouldn't have to worry about energy problems. But it's not the case. Now, on the other hand, if we have an ideal gas that is behaving polytropically, then PV equals MRT is also true. In that case, 
then instead of having PV, we could just have MR, and you'd end up with T2 less T1. So this equation is only good for an ideal gas that is behaving polytropically. In other words, this equation is more valuable than this equation. But sometimes this equation is more handy. Okay? You can't use this for an ideal, or for a, a uh, I'm sorry, you can't use this for a real gas that's behaving polytropically. But you can use this for a real gas behaving polytropically. You can use this for an ideal gas behaving polytropically. You can use this for an ideal gas behaving polytropically. You can't use this for an ideal gas that is not obeying, obeying the polytropic equation. And you can't use this for a real or an ideal gas that's not behaving the polytropic equation. Okay. What's polytropic again? DV to the C. Nothing more, nothing less. That's all it is. What's ideal gas? Well, I've already told you that it's gas far away from its critical point, right? So we have a little bit more definition of what an ideal gas is, but frequently you'll find this equation to be true. You'll just find that a gas is behaving that because of the nature of the surroundings that it's in. For example, you have a balloon with a diameter proportional of the pressure, I think, is proportional to the diameter of the balloon, uh, because the balloon has some spring constant essentially. You'll find that the gas is away from this. But it can be hard to find it. So notice that your authors, uh, let's see, do they give you, no, they don't give you this equation. You might want to add this equation next to the polytropic equation and note that there's one more restriction on it. And that is that you have to have an ideal gas. It's not good for uh, a non-ideal gas, a real gas. But sometimes, like I said, this is a lot handier than this. It's easy to derive because PV is equal to MRT for a an ideal gas. What did you say to add by it? Add the restriction that is only good for an ideal gas. This yeah, one well, is only good for an ideal gas. That's right. You get the isothermal process of an ideal gas. Get that in just a minute. That's, that's a different equation. That one. Yeah, that's a little bit different equation. The other one, the PV2 minus P1V. Yeah, that's good for real gas. Good for anything. Well, anything that's behaving polytropically. So you may want to highlight the, the restriction at the top of that equation that says polytropic process. Because that has to be true before you can use that equation. Any polytropic process. Yep. All right. So what about when n is equal to 1? Well, if n is equal to 1, then the polytropic equation reduces to PV equals C because the exponent on the volume is a 1. We normally don't write that. We just understand that it's there. So can we use this equation when n is equal to 1? It would blow up. So this equation won't serve as well if P times V is equal to a constant. In that case, what do we have to do? Well, it turns out, if you had an ideal gas at constant temperature, then PV equals to, is equal to uh, MRT, right? where T is the constant temperature that never changes. Okay? So notice the similarity between these two. PV equals a constant. Because the mass of the system, the gas constant, all that would be the same. If the temperature is the same. Then these are the same type of problem, and we still can't use this equation. What can we use? Let's find out. Well, essentially, this says PV equals some constant C. It's just a complicated constant, MR T naught. So let's plug that in. This tells us how pressure depends on volume. Basically, pressure is the constant over volume. So then what? Well, like I said, all we're trying to do is integrate 1 over x dx, which is just the natural logarithm of x. But we're using V instead. So we have C, which is a constant, came outside of the integral times the natural logarithm of V evaluated between states 1 and 2, in other words, between the limits of integration. In that case, what we have is C, natural log of V2 less natural log of V1. If you remember your rules of natural logarithms, when you have natural logarithms of something minus the natural logarithm of something else, you just put the two arguments as a ratio, and it's the same thing. If you don't believe this is true, try it with your calculator sometime. You'll see, pick any two numbers you want for the number that goes here and the number that goes 
here and see if it works. It will. Remembering that that constant C is just PV, you plug that in, and that's how they came up with the equation uh, on page uh, 195 that's listed is equation 4. Okay. In fact, there's two forms of it because you could substitute for PV, you could substitute MRT naught. Okay. Now, what I want you to write in your book is uh, P1, V1, they've only listed this equation, you can plug in P2, V2. And when you're in the middle of a quizam, you may not think of that. So you might want to just know that you can plug in P2, V2 here instead. You can't just flip these two willy-nilly. That won't work. Where are you? I mean, but right here, P1, V1, the first bit, can be P2, V2. I mean, that's in the book? That is in the book. It's on page 195, equation 4. So is this a misprint? This is supposed to be isothermal? Yes, it should be isothermal, not isothermal. Never noticed that. So. Is it still V2 over V1? LNV2 it over is still a natural logarithm of V2 less V1. That's right. Where V2 just represents the final state of the system, V1 represents the initial state of the system. Now, if you remember all the derivation grades, you don't, don't worry about it. Here's what you need. Now, you just have to be careful to select the correct boundary equation so that you get your answer right. The boundary work equation. Okay, let me see if I can work an example problem. If I can't, I should probably quit. I think we have enough now so that we could work problem number 45. Now, I haven't written this one out as an example problem, so you may want to take notes on it. But I will try to get around to adding it in. And I've never worked this one before, so I don't know how it's going to come out. Hopefully it will be clear enough where you can understand it. Perhaps, I think. But it may not be the smoothest presentation you've ever seen. I don't think any of my presentations are particularly smooth. All right. So we've got a system. There's an electric resistance coil in the system, and a piston. So we've got a piston cylinder device. There is a voltage or a difference in electric potential that's represented as delta V between these two points, between the either end of the resistor. Apparently there's a current flowing through it. I, that's what your authors told us. There are 0.8 kilograms of saturated liquid R134A. That's a lot of information. First of all, there's R134A tells us what, what chemical we have so we can represent its behavior. Um, and there's a mass of 0 0.8 kilograms. And we're told that it is a saturated liquid. What does that tell you? How do I write that in math? The symbol we use for quantifying how saturated something is. Quality. Quality. Or at least what the ratio is. So the quality is it's saturated liquid. So what is the quality? What percentage is in the vapor phase? Zero. None of it. So the quality is exactly zero. Let me switch black pens because I think this pen is given out. I want to show it on the video. That's better. Okay, what else did they tell us? Uh, let's see. Initial temperature is negative 5 degrees Celsius. Uh, let's see. And it is a weighted piston cylinder device. So they didn't tell us what the pressure is, but could we find out the pressure? It would be pretty easy, right? Go to the saturation tables if you would for R134A and tell me what the pressure is. Because notice they, they've given us information. They've told us that T is T sat. In other words, since we have saturation conditions, this must be a saturation temperature. So all you have to do is look up negative 5 degrees Celsius and tell me what the saturation pressure is. Thank you. 
negative negative six, negative four, negative six. Okay, so it's halfway between, so we should use these, right? Let's go do it. Make our lives easier. By the way, interpolating is really easy. Just take the average. Page uh, 926. What's the number on this problem? I'm sorry, it's 45. 4 45. What number did you come up with? 241. 241. Wow. 0.65. Okay. So we only need one set. So I'm going to eliminate all these. Uh, let's see. We want to know uh, what do we know? We know the uh, temperature is negative 5 Celsius. And we know the quality. We're not asking what the quality is. You know what? Let me see if I can undo. No, I can't undo. I'm going to make my life a little easier so I know the syntax. I'm going to reopen this. And instead of eliminating everything, what I'm going to do is figure out which set has similar information to what I need. We've got a temperature and a quality. So I guess I could use set two. And uh, let's see. I'm going to move this. Let's just do it this way. We, we're not going to calculate the quality that's given. Uh, let's see. We're not going to calculate. No, we do need to calculate pressure, so I'll get rid of the, <coughs> that. So negative, oops, negative 5 Celsius should be the temperature. We're not going to uh, know the specific volume. We're going to calculate pressure, quality. We may, may as well get a specific volume over here. And temperature specified. You guys see what I'm doing? I'm just using the uh, bits and pieces that I need. I need to specify the temperature, I need to specify the quality, but I know that the quality is actually zero. And this is all for one. Wrong key. Okay, so I think I've done it all right. Uh, checked, everything's okay. Calculate. Uh, what's wrong? Oh, it's steam. I forgot to change that again to R134. Okay, so now let's calculate. Okay, we've got one set, and apparently the temperature is 243.5. Is that what you said? Yeah. Good. I don't remember what I said. I said 244. Okay, so we've got the uh, saturation pressure from E's 243.5 kilopascals. Now, since this is a piston cylinder device, obviously this is going to be state one. We're going to go to state two. Since, a, since it is a piston cylinder device and we've added energy, I haven't read that far yet, but I'm sure they're going to add energy to it, uh, to which 10 volts are applied, causing a current of 2 amperes to flow through the resistor. Determine the time required for the refrigerant to be converted to saturated vapor and the final temperature. So they've given us some information. They've told us that during this process, current flows. And basically, ultimately what happens is you transfer, uh, you're transferring electrical work, you know, or you're putting power in at a certain rate, just the voltage times the current, which is 2 amps. Sorry, there's an equal sign. But basically all that work becomes thermal energy. Right? It doesn't become heat because there's no heat absorbed crossing the system boundary. If you were to define the system to not include this coil and just everything else around the coil, all the, the, the R134, then you could say that heat's crossing the system boundary. But just to keep it simple, I'm going to do this and say it's work. And that work gets changed into thermal energy. Now one of the questions they asked us we can answer immediately because if you think about it, we went from a saturated liquid to a saturated vapor, they told us that. And you know that we haven't removed any pressure from the piston. We still have the exact same weight. So what is the pressure in state two? State 
once. 243.5 kilopascals. It's still on saturation. Right? It's still in the saturation region. It may be on the verge of it, right? It's on the saturated vapor line. It's on the verge of going into the superheated region. Well, we stopped it as soon as we boiled off the very last drop of liquid. So what's the temperature in state two? It's a negative saturation temperature, going to negative five degrees Celsius. Does it seem strange that we add a lot of energy to the system and yet all that's happening is the temperatures remain constant? They're all changing the state. Changes, well, you mean change in phase. The change in phase, right? There was a big change in phase. We boiled off a bunch of liquid. What else happened? That? Time passed. Time passed. Yeah, but there's another energy flow. I haven't drawn it. There's an energy flow in here. You're right. But there was a change in the internal energy because of the phase change. Mm -hmm. tipped down onto the wall. It was boundary work. Right. Because you guys know as well as I do, this piston's going to move up. Yeah. And so therefore, there was boundary work that came out of the system. So. There was a deposit here, there was a change in the account balance, but there was a big withdrawal here. Okay. Now there's no way that the withdrawal would be as big as the deposit, okay. because there's still some accumulated account balance. But basically what we're saying here is that the boundary work plus the change in internal energy has to balance the amount of electrical energy that came in. It's just a real simple energy balance. We can start with the big energy balance and write it, but Now they've asked how how long should the this current flow in order to make this happen? Well, could you quantify this piece? Yeah, you just need to know how it can be. So. Right, right. So let's go and find that out. Now it's, it's not going to help us a lot. I'll show you why in just a second. But let's start off by doing this. Okay. So go and find out. What well, was I right or wrong when I said that? You were right. Actually, you know what? We'll we'll do this too. You're right. We'll do it two ways, and hopefully it won't confuse you guys too much. Let's start off quantifying this. So the change in internal energy, it went from a saturated liquid to a saturated vapor. So what does that mean? That means we went from UF to UG. Right? So if you would, please help me find out. If, grab a piece of paper, you're going to need it. Well, no, never mind. Okay, well, let's do it this way. I don't like negative five degrees. You can't change it. I want you guys to be able to look up numbers without a calculation. Do they have negative six in there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. And negative four. Okay, which do you want? Negative four or negative six? Negative six. Negative six is. Let's change our pressure. What's the pressure now? At negative six. 234.44. Yes. That's kilopascals, and like I said, that's going to be the same over here. It's not very far away from what you're all doing, so this should be fine. Negative 6 Celsius, 234.44 kilopascals. Okay, so now you can look it all up and we don't have to mess with these. It's not easy, it's not easy enough, I guess. All right, so now tell me what UF is. In other words, what's the internal energy in state 1? 43.66 kilojoules. I'm sorry, 43? 43.66. 43.66 kilojoules per kilogram. Uh -huh. Okay, somebody else. What's the internal energy in state 2? 226.8. 226.8 kilojoules per kilogram? Thank you. Now, not surprisingly, we have more internal energy in state 2 per unit mass than we have in state 1. How many unit masses do we have? 1.8, right? Well, we have 0.8 kilograms. So let's figure out the total internal energy in state one. It's just the mass times the specific internal energy. It's going to be less than this because we don't even have a whole kilogram to hold all 43.66 kilojoules. Right? Now, if we had two kilograms, it would be more. So let's find out. Mass 0.8 kilograms times, or 80% of 43.66 is how much? 34.93. 34.93. Reason is 80 percent is because the mass uh, is 20 kilograms. Do the same thing if you would for the internal energy in state two. That's supposed to be a U. A big U. Is 
capital use for total internal energy and lowercase use for specific income. How much is it? It does look like it. I'm sorry. How much? Thank you. Yeah. It's not thermodynamics that makes this class hard, it's not writing. <laughs> I actually agree with you. I wish I had better memory show. You know the ironic part of this all is that my mother was a glitter for her writing was absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> anyway, so to calculate delta U, we need U2 less U1. So we just need the total internal energy in state two less the total internal energy in state one. So just take the difference between those two. 181.44 less 34.93 is how much? 183.13. So that's how much the account balance changed. We had a deposit of 183.13 kilojoules. Yeah, there's no way. You're right. It's 146. How much is it? 146.51. We found a difference. 46.51. Yeah, we figured out a way to uh, create UFG. UFG, yeah, that's right. That's right. Do they have UFG listed? Yeah, 20.13. And so if you take that and multiply it by 0.8, you'll get this number. Yeah. Right. That makes sense? What wasn't happening there is the mass wasn't being multiplied. It's okay. All right. That's why you're in the class. <clears throat> no, I don't Okay, so now we've got delta U. Now how about the boundary work? Do we know how the pressure varies as a function of volume? The pressure here is 234. The pressure here is 234. It's constant. It turns out that the boundary work equation integrates really easily when you have constant pressure. It's just the pressure comes out you have uh, the integral of dv, which is just v evaluated from state 1 to state 2. So it is simply p naught v2 less v1. This is only good when you have a constant pressure process. In fact, go to, uh, you don't have to write that down if you don't want to, verify for me if you would, that it is listed in the summary equations. Go back to page 195. And you'll notice that for a constant pressure process, they say an isobaric process. You might want to write constant pressure so you remember what that is. I know you know what isobaric is, but in the heat of an exam, you never know what you know. What page is 195? 195. Where it says isobaric, the equation is already written down. I just want you to make a note that that means constant pressure. Anyone have the equation number? Is it equation two or three? Two. Okay, I just found equation two. And like what? Constant pressure. You know for sure what isobaric means when you use that equation. Well, this is a constant pressure process, so I can use the equation. All right. The only problem is I need to know the volume of the system, and I don't know that. Yes. No, no, no. But I said, why you got it? You looked up the in specific internal energy. Couldn't you have also looked up the specific volume in state one? That would just be the uh, And couldn't you do the same thing over here? Yeah, Vg yeah, would be the specific volume in state two. Right? So what are the specific volumes in those two states? Yeah, I mean it's just the mass times well, the specific volume of the fluid. Exactly, you're on the right track. The volume in state one, the total volume, would be the mass times the specific volume in state one. Yep, the interpreter. But we need the specific volume first, so go ahead and look it up. Saturated liquid? Sure. What do you got? Uh, 0.0007608. 307608? Thank you. And so that would be cubic meters per kilogram. Let me get, get rid of this arrow. You guys have that link right now. Somebody else, how about the specific volume in state two? 0.08802. Uh, I'm sorry, 0 0.085 what? 802. 802, thank you. Cubic meters per kilogram. 
Okay, so now we can calculate the total volume. If we wanted to, we could simply calculate the volume change, right? Because this could be calculated as P naught M V2 less V1, where I'm using specific volume. It'd be the same thing. So somebody take the difference between V2 and V1 and then multiply by 0.8. So we're going to calculate this piece right here. Basically, we're going to calculate V2 total less V1 total. Here is 0 0.068. Yeah, no, that's oh yeah, times the max. Yes, that's that's with me multiplying by 0.8. It looks reasonable. But you've got uh, I don't know why this thing is that reasonable. We've got three zeros here, so that's going to take away from here. I think it should be 085. Sorry. Oh well, then you multiply by 80 percentage. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah, that is 0.085. 802 minus 0 0.000. 0 right. Right. And then times 80%. Yeah, that may be good. Anyone second that? Yeah. 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 All right. So the pressure is, uh, let's see, where's the pressure? 234.44 kilopascals. And we have to multiply that by the 0 0.068 cubic meters per kilogram. What kind of units are we going to have here? Kilojoules per kilogram, because you have kilopascals times cubic meter, so you'll have kilojoules per kilogram. Right? Oh, so we already multiplied by mass. Right, we've already multiplied by mass. Right. Because we were using specific volumes. We we already got. Oh oh, we got rid of our. I'm sorry. We got rid of. I'm sorry. You're right. Because right. you multiplied that. So now we multiply by kilojoules. You're right. <coughs> Where's that conversion? It's in the back of the book, but it's kind of hard to find. So just write down that uh, kilopascal times a cubic meter is equal to a kilojoule. And you'll have it. You know, I put it near the energy conversion or pressure conversion, right? Just to mean it there. What does that equal again? This bit? I don't know. Nobody's told me yet. Yeah, it's a kilojoule. Oh, uh, yeah. A, a kilopascal times a cubic meter is a kilojoule. So this piece here is 15.95 kilojoules. Anyone second that? Yeah. Right. Good. So 15.95. So the boundary work wasn't the biggest bit of it, right? <coughs> what happened is most of the deposits stayed in the bank. It's 146.51 kilojoules. <coughs> so that's how much electrical work is required. Just add these two together. And that's the total uh, deposit of electricity that we require, right? So somebody add these two together. Tell me what the number is. 162.46 kilojoules. Thank you. <coughs> now, they didn't ask for that. They said, how much time does it take those to happen? Because what you have to understand is the electrical power, when you calculate volts times amps, 10 volts times 2 amps, and you get 20 <coughs> watts, you're talking about the rate at which energy is flowing. You're not talking about a total amount. This is the total amount of energy that we need to deposit. This is the rate at which it's being deposited. This is like our, our hourly wage. Okay? This is like our total day's wages. Because a watt is a joule per second. That's right, a watt is a joule per second. So we're only putting in 20 joules per second. Now, another way to look at it, we're only putting in 0 0.02 kilojoules per second. It takes a lot of this thing. It takes a lot, yeah. In fact, the <coughs> equation we want to use is pretty simple. The electrical work we need is equal to power, electrical power times time. In fact, all we will do is rearrange it to solve for time. So the electrical work divided by the electrical power is the answer we're looking for. As long as we have consistent units, just take 162.46 and 
divide it by 0 0.02, and that'll tell you how long this is. Well, what's, how many seconds have you got there? Uh, 8,123 seconds. 8,123 seconds. So, yeah, divided by 3,600, you'll have hours. So, yeah, 2.25 hours. Yeah. 2.26 hours. <coughs> okay. okay. This is not really a difficult problem <coughs> if you're thinking about it right. If you're not thinking about it right, it's a really hard problem. The right way to think about it is first and foremost an energy balance approach, okay, which is where is energy coming in, where is it leaving, and how is it staying in the system? That's the first thing to think about because that's key. There's no point in looking up a bunch of properties if you don't know what you're going to do with them. Okay? So you've got to think about where all the energy flows. It's easy to miss this one. This boundary work is really easy to miss if you don't think about it. Okay? They gave us a hint by telling us that this was a weighted. So uh, anyway, and then what's the next key? Well, the next key is remembering all these little details with internal energy and knowing that the only thing that changed here is the internal energy of the system. Okay, that's one of the keys. And realizing you can use specific volume. Specific volume was very important to us because we used it to evaluate the boundary board. I'm going to show you a shortcut now. This is somewhat of a red herring. Have you ever watched a mystery story? <clears throat> Who done it? Well, there's tons of red herrings in those, right? You've got a group of people, and one of them had to be the one that killed Mr. Body, right? There's only, only five people that could have done it, right? And as the story unfolds, of course, all of them had a motive, right? There's some facts where you don't know about. So as a, from the detective's point of view, you have to find out what happened and why they all were, you know, hated this person and were willing to kill him. And by the way, it was a good thing they died most of the time, right? <laughs> So there are always red herrings because they throw in all these things that really are not necessary for solving this one. Well, what I'm about to show you can be somewhat of a red herring, so don't get hung, on a, hung up on it too much. Okay? Let me, instead of going this way, let me go a different way. The boundary work and the internal energy can be combined because if you think about it, what you have here, uh, wait a second, let me make sure I did this right. Boundary work. One thing I haven't told you about all those boundary work equations is that they assume that work is coming out of the system. Okay, so in other words, if you get a positive result from the boundary work that you calculated, it means that work is coming out of the system. So in this case, we know boundary work is coming out of the system, so that's okay. So my everything's all right. It, it is correct. Uh, but basically, um, if I plug in P naught, I'm going to need some space. Change my mind here one more time. We don't need all this stuff anymore. We're still working with the same problem. And so you know that the boundary work can be represented like this. The internal energy change could be written like this, because that's what the delta means. Right? Now, the pressure is the same in both states, but I can go ahead and multiply it through. And since the pressure is, in the, is the same in both states, I can go ahead and just give the pressure the subscripts of the states, and I still have the same thing. Now, if I put P2, V2 plus U2 together, and I put U1, which is negative, and P1, V1 together. Where the negative sign go? It's right here. You might recognize that this is the enthalpy in state 2, and this is the enthalpy in state 1. I don't particularly like this, but your author does it many times. So I want to explain what's going on here. It looks like you're saying that the enthalpy of the system changes from state 1, one to state 2. But the system cannot hold enthalpy. Okay. Just because there's a pressure in here and there's a volume doesn't mean that there's another form of energy being held by this. That is not the case. The only thing that this holds is internal energy. Just because you can calculate a number doesn't mean it's something that the system has. Okay. Now, we could make our lives a lot easier by performing this calculation 
for the electrical work, and we will get the exact same thing. In fact, this will simply be HFG, because it's still HG here in state two and HF in state one. Which is known that it's the most saturated states. Exactly, that's the key. Well, that's another thing. So let's try it. The mass is 0.8 kilograms. Look up HFG. You like it? It's fun when there's a shortcut. But there's not always. 203.07 kilojoules per kilogram. How much? 203.07. 203.07 kilojoules per kilogram. So kilograms go away. We should get the number out of the range. 162.456. Five or so. There you go. That's what we got before, right? That's good. So <clears throat> the only reason this works is because it's a constant pressure process. That's the only reason it works. If you want a constant pressure, you cannot combine the two this way. You don't because you want to know within the It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, because the pressure is different. Right. Exactly. So like I said, this is a red herring. If you understand it, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Really not all that important, although your author seems to think so. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay. I'll do my best to try and write that one up for you so that I can uh, post it. <clears throat> the problem is I forget to do all these things. That's why I have to write them down. Okay. Well, let's go over uh, one more topic. We still have about ten minutes. And that's enough time to look at another topic, which is heat capacity. It's not, it's not going to sink in. Sorry? It won't sink in. <laughs> well, at least you're honest. <laughs> it won't sink in until we work the problem. So let me just get through the slides so we can solve the problem next time, okay? I'm, and, let, and I'll go ahead and tell you guys, I'm pulling pretty hard, mainly because I realized that until we get through entropy, you guys probably cannot uh, build the system and make it work well, okay? You need more information and you probably remember me too far. And it's going to take us through about chapter seven to get through it. So I'm trying to pull hard to get at least one chapter a week because you'll get bits and pieces over here. That's fine. Okay, I'll do my best to reinforce it so you get these grades on the exams or many quiz exams. But I think when you're really going to learn the stuff that's really going to be real and mean something to you is when you're building the project okay, and you're trying to do calculations to figure out, well, how big does the pump need to be? I don't know. I've got to figure that out. And you will realize how important the design temperatures are, because the design temperatures of the thermal source and thermal sink are going to be very critical. Okay, you can't make an air conditioner, well, it's not easy to make an air conditioner. I don't think anyone in industry has tried. Make an air conditioner that works between any temperature you want. Okay, that wouldn't be really practical. Air conditioners, heat pumps, refrigerators all have certain ranges that they're supposed to work with. Okay, outside of that range, they just don't function very well. So anyway. Bread versus water. If you put bread in the microwave, you put water in the microwave, you heat them both up, what happens? You do it one at a time. Same amount of time. Turns out that the microwave puts the same amount of energy in because it only has a certain rate at which it can put energy in, right? It turns out that you'll put the same amount of energy in the water you put in the bread, but the bread's going to come out scalding hot and the, the water's still going to be tipping, right? It's not going to be very warm. So why? We put the same amount of energy in both. Why? Well, it could be due to the size, right? If you have a huge loaf of bread, yeah, it's probably going to take some time to heat up. Okay? And more particularly, it could be due to the mass. Because if you think about it, bread is typically nowhere near as dense as, as water. Right? And so maybe it's a mass difference. So more mass means more time for both bread and water okay, to accomplish the same temperature change. But if we take that into account, and we make sure that the bread has the same mass as the water we put in, it still will take longer to heat up the water than it does the bread. And it's still the case. So the way we look at this, we put 10 kilojoules into a mass of bread that is the same mass as the mass of water, let's say. And we notice that there's a large change in the temperature of the bread. If we do the same thing, put the same deposit into this bank account, there's a smaller change in the temperature. So we say that the water has a large heat capacity the bread has a small heat capacity. In other words, it doesn't have much tolerance for energy. It doesn't have much tolerance for, for heat. It changes its temperature a lot as a result of a relatively small deposit of energy. Does that make sense? So there's a difference. There's a way we can quantify the, the 
capacity that something has. It's simply a ratio. It's the amount of energy added divided by the temperature change response. So if I add 10 kilojoules and the bread changes by one degree, then it has a capacity of 10 kilojoules per degree. Right? If I add 10 kilojoules to the water and it changes by 0.5 degrees, then the water has a heat capacity of 10 over 0.2 is 20, 20 kilojoules per degree. Now we don't normally like to talk about something that depends on the size of the system because the more bread I have, the more energy I can dump in and have a lower change in temperature. So what we'll do instead is talk about energy change per unit mass, so per kilogram of bread or per kilogram of water. And then instead of using total energy change of the mass, we use the specific energy change, the amount of energy change, or how much I deposit per kilogram or per pound in the whole system. Does that make any sense? So normally we talk about specific heat capacity. That's what we use most of the time. And so if we look at something like helium, and we'll just put a, a unit, a kilogram, of helium into a constant volume container, and raise the temperature by one degree Celsius, we note that it takes 3.12 kilojoules to accomplish that change. That kilogram required 3.12 kilograms, or kilojoules, of energy in order to raise its temperature by one degree. Now if we put that same helium, or, well, if we put a different chemical in here, it will require a different amount of energy, because it has a different heat capacity. But if we put that same kilogram into a piston cylinder device, the same one kilogram require the same one degree Celsius temperature change, we find it takes 5.19 kilojoules now to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius. What happened? It seems like the heat capacity all of a sudden increased. Right? It's more tolerant. We had to give it more. Yeah. It's different, different pressures. So the pressure. You have a constant um, volume here, and constant pressure there. So why does that make a difference? Well, because the numbers are different. <laughs> right. Well, the numbers are measured. That, that, that's the amount of energy we measured we had to put Boundary work? Boundary work. You got it. Because think about it. We put in a deposit here, but the piston moved up, doing boundary work against the atmosphere. So some of the energy went into boundary work. So you got it. So some of that energy flowed out as a boundary. So the left is rigid and the right is not. That's correct. The left is rigid and the right is not. Anytime there's volume change, there's probably boundary work. Anytime there's volume change, there's likely boundary work. Unless you're in outer space, you don't have to push an atmosphere out of the way. What are you doing about the constant? Leprechaun. Leprechaun. And unicorn. <laughs> I think we're all really tired of this class. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you? In space, aren't you working at dense it though to keep the atmosphere inside the spaceship? Sorry. Well, certainly you have to get some pressure up. But what, what I'm saying is if you put this piston cylinder device and there's no atmosphere, it doesn't take anything to push that piston up. There's so, nothing. Is, so those two numbers will be the same then. Exactly. Okay, well, I think we're pretty much done. Let me see. There's, there is one thing I want you to do. Unfortunately, you guys have put your things away. So you can write it next time. We'll come to this class and you can write it next time. But I'm going to have you write this over and over. Unfortunately, the heat capacity is more a property of the helium than it is a property of the process. So sometimes we will use Cv when we have a volume change. Sometimes we will use Cp, the so-called constant pressure heat capacity, when we have a constant volume. And that can be very confusing to students. And so what I want you to write when you get back, I'm going to say, I'll remind you, you will write CV equals delta U over delta T, and CP equals delta H over delta T, whereas delta H includes boundary work because this is a constant pressure process. Okay? So I'll have you write that down. If you want to write it down, it's fine if your notebook's still open. If not, I'm going to have you write this about 10 more times. So I'm right trying to build up this. Excuse me? Yes, I need your group names up here. Thank you for reminding me. What is delta U? Well, wait a minute. Right. Yeah, go ahead. You have delta U over delta T. Yeah. Delta U over delta H over delta T. But in that delta H, it is delta U plus boundary group because this would be delta U. Here is a change. Yeah, I guess.